live along with Danielle Smith here uh, on 770 CHQR and 630 Chet down in Calgary. Just waiting uh, confirmation from our team. Are we simulcasting right now or are we not? We are. We're on in Calgary. Danielle, good morning. Hey, Ryan Jesperson. Um, uh, can you go easy on me today? I'm having a little <laughs> bit of PTSD flashbacking to the 2012 election and I'm sure we're going to disagree on a few issues today. So I'm just letting you know I'm, I'm feeling a little sick to my stomach about this campaign. Well, okay. I, I want to make sure that, that I understand exactly what you're talking about. I've just seen a tweet that you sent out a couple of hours ago, Amy at David Kleimenhager, the political commentator. Is that what we're talking about no, here? No, 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 no. We're talking about the resignation of another candidate here in Calgary right. today, Eva Kariakas. We, we can talk about that one, too. Everyone's trying to think that, say that my column last week was an endorsement of Notley. I, I actually think it was the opposite. Anyone who listens to me knows that I'm a Ralph Klein conservative and we need a Ralph Klein conservative now and that I'm a Jason Getty supporter and I hope he wins. And so I thought it was hilarious that they looked at my column as an endorsement of Notley. I think, in fact, uh, she is trying to 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 put out there that she is the the second coming of Peter Lougheed because Peter Lougheed was a very popular premier she's crafted her her persona that way and I think that she could run on that and probably win a lot of PCs over but instead she's deciding to do this this most vicious ugly disgusting smear campaign that I've ever seen damage your credibility because that is something Peter Law he never would have done. Okay, so let's let our listeners know that they can also be our viewers today, Danielle. They yeah. can watch this simulcast all the way through till 11 o'clock on our Facebook Live channels for CHQR and, and Chad will be monitoring our text lines and our Twitter uh, just like we normally would, although it sounds like you might have your shut down right now. Uh, we have our <laughs> I'm always prepared to have people send me text, but I, I just, you know what I want to go through? I, did you have a chance to read Eva Carey or, or watch Eva Kariakis's video to see the three the three tweets that, that uh, caused her to resign? I'm aware of the three tweets that she's talking about. Let's get into it. Can, we, talk, can we talk about them? Because I want to give you my perspective, but I want to hear yours, and then I want to hear what listeners have to say sure. about it. Because she, I just played her full video so that she could um, she could demonstrate, or she could give her side of the story. Yeah. So the first one is she retweeted a, a story about Germany's Muslim migrant rape crisis spirals out of control. And uh, she, the, the image, she says, is, is probably the most offensive. It says, rape fugees, stay away, not not welcome. And so she acknowledged, yeah, bad image, but this issue of women being uh, raped by by migrant gangs is one that I'm going to stand up and defend. Um, I think that that is a, it's a position that I've had segments on this show where we've talked about that issue. What, what, why is this a firing fence? Why is this something that she has to resign over? Well, number one, I, I guess she's the one that made the decision to resign. That's the first point that I'll make. Uh, but I think it's it's probably worth pointing out that there are a couple of other posts as well. Oh, well, hold on, though. I want to go through each of them, but I want to Well, yeah, understand. but I mean, it might be one of those things where maybe it's like a death by a thousand cuts okay. kind of a thing, or maybe death by three. Okay, let me let me read all of them then, just so people are, have the same one. Um, she's responding to somebody on the issue of uh, non- uh, so, so trans transgender women who have not yet um, had their had their surgery, mm -hmm. being in uh, women's washrooms, and her response is, "I should not. Ha I should have the right to choose for my children to be not brainwashed into accepting perversions as quote alternate lifestyles." She said, "Quote alternate lifestyles is ha the ter terminology that the other person was using, and the perversion she was referring to there was that an, um, a, a person who had not had their 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 uh, transition surgery being in a female washroom." And then the last one was um, her saying. Uh, about the issue of dressing modestly. She said, I disagree. The, it's a fact that males are very visual, and especially when they are young, they are very susceptible. It's just life. I think it's very prudent to have the females dress modestly. I know a four-year-old that was affected by magazines of women in underwear at preschool. Both males and females have to have self-control and respect for themselves and others. I have a five-year-old son, and it's not fair to put this entirely on males either. I can tell you, like, I've had I've had guests on, the show, on, on my show expressing those viewpoints on every single one of those issues so is is this a, is this something that you cannot say and run for po for political office what, what 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 do you find so offensive about what she put out there well i mean i've not gone on the record about what she put out there but i mean what i think probably a lot of people would find it i mean the whole idea of like rape fugees is just a moronic thing to say it's and i think it's it's painting entire communities and what it's doing danielle is it's pouring gasoline on a fire people that have a lot of angst and anger already at the number of refugees that are coming to canada although it's a negligible number compared to other countries 
uh, I think that that sort of is, is a dog whistle probably there. And and I don't know when she decided, I don't know this woman, I don't know when she decided to run for politics. Uh, I know a lot of people that are jumping to her defense are saying, hey, listen, if you went through any of our social media, you'd find things that were unflattering or things that would make us politically unmarketable. Um, the thing about I don't believe for a second, I mean, when she says she has the right to choose for her children to not be brainwashed into accepting perversions as alternative lifestyles, there is no way that the, quote, perversion she's discussing is uh, what she would say would be a man in woman's clothing in the woman's washroom. That's not the perversion. She's she's talking about uh, trans individuals as perversions. In other words, the idea that, a, that an alternative lifestyle is a choice, right? Not an identity, not part of who you are, and that these individuals are perverse. And I've also seen a, a follow-up quote as well. One of hers posted that she didn't believe that uh, gay straight alliances were support circles, but they were they were conversion attempts or they were conversion clubs, uh, which, which just sort of perpetuates, I think, a narrative that is inaccurate and unfair. Uh, with regards to whether or not this is a fireable offense or whether or not she has to resign, I would imagine this is either her decision or the party's decision. And either way, that is either her, Daniel, or the party acknowledging that they don't think that she's a politically viable candidate anymore. And quite frankly, I don't believe it's a smear campaign. Now, this is nasty, ugly politics. And you and I have the good news is 49 more minutes to keep hashing this out. But it's not a smear campaign when you point out things people have said and when everything you're putting in front of people is the truth. That's not a smear campaign, is it? Well, I think what it is, is it, it's when you take it out of context and don't allow a person to describe the context and give a, a more full discussion about what it is that they're concerned about. And the reason why she did this is she knew she wouldn't get that platform and it would just she would just end up getting Huntsburgered, let's call it, where the, there isn't any context that you can put forward if you're a person with strong religious values um, in explaining why it is you personally feel a particular way that may run outside the, the mainstream. I guess I have a view that you can be a person with strong religious values, attend a church or a mosque or a synagogue or a temple that doesn't allow gay marriage, but have that be your private views and your private life. And then when you get into public life, that you 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 turn yourself your attention to the issues that you have the authority to do something on. And you care about health care and you care about education and you care about social services. I don't I think there's a private sphere and I, I'm just worried that if we continue to condemn people with strong religious views, no no one with strong religious views is going to run for office again. Yeah, well, I mean the, the, hey I, I, on a side note, did Alan Huntsberger get Huntsbergered or did you get Huntsbergered? <laughs> you got Huntsbergered. But I guess this is why I, for me, uh, I feel like people who have strong religious views have a place in public life. But I think increasingly we're getting to a point where the only people who are going to be allowed to run for office without being hounded are going to be people who are secular humanists or uh, identify as atheists who have no religious convictions whatsoever. Hmm. And I don't know that that would be a better outcome than having religious diversity, which is what we're all supposed to respect. Uh, I'm with you on the religious diversity thing. I think that one of the things worth pointing out is typically when, when people will point out either, you know, whether it's a, a, a an MLA or an MP or for that matter, any level of uh, elected government or position, Position, when someone's religious views, whether they're Muslim or Jewish or Christian or whatever, you know, you get the idea. Uh, whenever those start to infringe, like when they step off their lawn onto somebody else's lawn in asserting their relig religious conviction, whether that's a woman's right to choose, whether that's, you know, their belief on funding public schools or not, or which private schools or home schools they think should be, we get the idea. We could go down a number of rabbit holes here. That's where I think people take issue. One of the things I think is particularly interesting here, Danielle, is you might be right. Maybe Canada is more secular of a nation than the United States. I mean, you know, what did Robert Mueller do yesterday when he was ready to step in front of the cameras. He, he attended church with his wife, right? That's what every American president does. It's what high-profile American senators and, and representatives in Congress do. The idea of, of church being so important to the United States, but you don't see it a lot outside the Christian faith. In other words, those expressions of it, those public ones. And I think that's probably because there are really strong bases of support that are there to either be grabbed or maintained as part of those public shows. Well, I think it's. I think you're quite right. We are also very heavily influenced by U.S. politics and U.S. issues. And because certain things, like abortion is coming back as an issue in the U.S., where they're banning late trimester abortions in some 
in some uh, states, and they're still having this battle over transgender washrooms and, and GSAs. I think that people think that that reflects on our politics here, but we've made decisions on those issues. We've made uh, multipartisan decisions on those things. And so what I don't understand is why it is having moved forward from those contentious debates and we've gotten to a point where we have agreement, well, why fight a campaign where you're constantly dredging up these, 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 these issues? Because no one uh, no one thinks that Jason Kenney is going to go back and uh, fight against spousal rights. Uh, so why does that become a central feature? Why would anyone think that he's going to roll back the, the GSA legislation? He obviously has some concerns about how it's been enacted in some schools in some cases and wants to have parents more involved. But I haven't heard him say he's going to repeal the GSA legislation. So this is what I think is, un, is, is unfair in the debate is that that you're, you're taking the fears of a community that that had my minority rights trampled on for a long time, and you're giving and and it's giving the impression that you're going to roll back the clock and and go back to those bad old days. And and I don't think that that's a, a fair way of depicting the, the debate that we're having today. That's Danielle Smith, uh, host on 770 CHQR. I'm Ryan Jesperson on 6:30. Chad out of Edmonton. Our simulcast part of our ongoing Decision Alberta coverage on our text line here in Edmonton to 6:30 6:30. Craig says you can as an elected representative, have strong religious views, but they have to be completely imperceptible. We'll keep the conversation rolling when we return on Chorus Radio. Chad, we're talking about today. Our, we're, we're focusing in for these next few weeks on issues that are going to be hot button during the campaign. This one is race, racism, and hate speech. Where do you cross the line? Have these candidates crossed the line? Should we have a broader view of what is acceptable in public discourse? I've got a couple people who've commented here. Uh, one says, "What's wrong with agnostics and atheists being the bulk of political candidates? We need to complete completely separate religion from politics, and that includes our leaders. Religion doesn't serve a place at the table when it comes to budget or." policy discussions. Want to be religious? Fine. Fund it yourself. I don't think anyone's saying that you should be funding it, but are you saying that if you are Jewish, if you're Christian, if you're Sikh, if you're Muslim, then uh, you have to uh, disavow your religion if you're going to seek public office? I mean, I think that's a pretty extreme position. Ryan, I don't know what, if you've got some comments from people coming in. Too. I mean, uh, yeah, well, we have a ton. Um, I mean, one guy just called me a Nazi. I'm not sure how that works out, Danielle, but I will say this. I think that the uh, a government should reflect reflect its people, right? And that means that we should see uh, we should see yarmulkes in our houses, uh, in the legislature, in the House of Commons. Uh, we should see turbans. Uh, I believe we should see crucifixes. And I believe that there should be people that uh, we have no idea which way they lean or what their beliefs are because, number one, it's none of our business, and number two, it's not impacting their policy decisions. So separating church and state or separating religion and politics doesn't mean that you can't have people of faith uh, working as politicians, I think it'll be a disservice to the, to the greater population. I just think that we have uh, human rights legislation in Canada. We have, uh, I, I believe, a, a, you know, I mean, basic human rights and basic values that we adhere to as Canadians. And I think that it's important that those are extended to all Canadians. And when there's a suspicion that it won't be, I mean, you know, let me give you an example here on the text line to 630-630. Listener says out of Red Deer this morning, thanks for tuning in and good morning, Red Deer. You know, Jason Kenney and his MLAs, this back to what you were saying earlier, Danielle, walked out of the legislature like close to 10 times when it came time to vote on protecting women accessing medical services. They're talking about that abortion clinic bubble zone bill. Listener goes on to say he's not said he would support GSAs that I'm aware of. He sounds like he wants to out gay kids to their parents. They're referencing Mr. Kenny's comments that he believes that parents have rights to be informed what clubs and what extracurricular activities their kids are involved in. Listener says, I think it's fair to say there are a lot of people wondering exactly what Jason Kenny would do if he were premier. Well, and I, I can understand some of the issues that they put forward, but, you know, there's always another side to it. I mean, part of the reason Jason had, and I disagreed with Jason taking all of his um, his MLAs out of the legislature. I think you should vote on issues as they come up because he's not going to be able to do that if in an opposition, a private member's bill, an issue comes forward that they disagree with. If you, if you walk everybody out and all that's left is those who agree with it, it's going to pass. So I think it was a flawed strategy to begin with, but he didn't want it to make an issue because he was saying the law is there as established by the courts. We don't need to have this uh, this legislation it's redundant the uh, and uh, so the other part of the of the real challenge i think is that when you talk to those who have strong religious faith they'll say and point to the charter of rights and freedoms 
where the number one first freedom is freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, and freedom of expression. And so w why is it that freedom of religion is something, I mean, it's in the charter, so what nobody's, does freedom of religion actually mean? Nobody's trotting on anyone's freedom to express anything they want. I, I think that these candidates, I mean, it's important to point out, though, this morning, you know, I mean, we're, we're talking about a, a conservative candidate, Eva Kiriakos, that's resigned. Either she or the party decided that she would resign, right? There wasn't some sort of heavy, it wasn't an elections Alberta committee decision it wasn't some sort of right I mean she resigned I mean, but, you, but you know why it's because if she didn't resign it would become the focal point of the campaign of and potentially tear down the entire party of and course. neither she nor the party wants to see that and so but why does it have to be that way like if people are so mad at her about her comments why not just say okay well this doesn't reflect on anybody else I'm not she's not right for me in my riding why is it that we we, we have to we have to see these extreme measures where well, it's completely I get, I, stripping out all of the candidates that's that's a question for the United Conservative Party brain trust, right? That's not it's not collective Albertans that made that decision. You no, know it is a, it is a, a question for voters is have we become so intolerant of being able to talk about contentious issues that the only way to deal with them is to shut a person up and say sorry, you've got no right to run for political office. I do think that we to we need to sort of I don't know if we want to rank the wrongs here. But, you know, and, and let's point out, number one, that, that we're specifically talking about one party right now. But that's just because in this context of what we're talking about today, it seems to be one party that's experiencing the most problems here. I'm sure if, like, we did a deep dive into a lot of the NDP candidates, we'd probably find gold as well, and we will as part of our decision Alberta coverage. But let, let's, let's sort of rank these, Danielle, if we will. Not actually, but let's point out some of the different stories we're looking at. Okay, so we've got Eva Kiriakos making the, the, the post about rape fugees and children being brainwashed accepting perversions as alternative lifestyles uh, you've, you've got the 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 Kaylin Ford resignation her comments that some said showed some white supremacist tendencies we can get into that if you like there's one that I think uh, Tunde Obasan a candidate out of Edmonton Southwest posted in 2017 dear wife if you want to bring out the best in your husband give him two things respect and sex in that order uh, Grant Hunter the United Conservative candidate and Tabor Warner writing a letter into the editor uh, how do people in a town like Carston, churn out a high number of individuals of substance. Perhaps they come from superior stock, though that reeks of Aryan undertones. That was his writing that said that. And then there's Jeremy Wong. This is an interesting one. Jeremy Wong, a pastor uh, out of Calgary, running in Mountain View, after Kaylin Ford bowed out, by the way. Uh, the NDP releasing audio of a sermon where the pastor quoted from Ephesians, that wives should submit to your husband's the sermon went on to suggest, my understanding is it was a Mother's Day sermon. Women are more in touch with their emotions than men. Oftentimes, guys are more cerebral. Uh, if we were taking a look at every single political candidate that would have ever quoted Scripture, and Scripture that might not hold up out of context in today's context, uh, there'd be a whole lot more people in trouble than Jeremy Wong. There are varying degrees of gaffes here that have been taking the headlines for the last week, week and a half. Okay, let's take a pause and we'll get our, our listeners to respond to it. We are doing cross-province coverage. We'll be doing this every Monday. Today our topic is race, racism, and hate speech. If you want to weigh in, 439-748-255 in Calgary. And Ryan, I'll give you the number for Edmonton when we get back on Chorus Radio. Decision Alberta coverage across Alberta. This hour continuing with Ryan Jesperson here out of 630 Chet in Edmonton, my colleague Danielle Smith out of the 770 CHQR studio hey, in Calgary. You, you had a long list. So let me let me tell you, I think that there is another list that we could be talking about. Mark Milkey just recently about, wrote a book asking the question, like, why does Rachel Notley wear a Che Guevara wrist, wristwatch? Why does Rod Loyola love Hugo Chavez? Why did Shannon Phillips uh, go on a panel to argue against Northern Gateway? Why did she write a book with Mike Hudima about how to stop pipelines? Um, the, these are the things that I think we don't talk about on the other side. There are extremists within the the, the NDP caucus, they put a veneer on it over the last four years because they realized that they couldn't get elected if they remained anti-oil sands. But when you look at, if they're going to dr dredge up uh, old tweets and dredge up uh, things that Jason Kenney did 30 years ago, isn't it relevant that we talk about the fact that the only time they mentioned pipelines prior to getting elected as government was to oppose them? Like, isn't that also equally relevant? And Do you think that nobody's talked about that? 
Uh, I think that it doesn't get the same. I don't think that the extremists within the NDP caucus, they're extreme in a different way. I don't think that, that gets talked about at all. No, I think we're all we're all acting as if, oh, no, look how nice and moderate they are. But I really, I don't think that a single person tuned in and uh, combining these two audiences, Danielle, I feel like there's 11 people in Alberta that aren't listening right now. But I don't think that it's news to anybody that Rod Loyola, the MLA, has comments on the record regarding Hugo Chavez. I don't think it's news to anybody but, but that Rachel it, Notley had a Che Guevara swap. I don't think that's news to anybody, but is isn't it? it's interesting that it's not a firing offense. It's not something that would be so outrageous that they would think, oh my goodness, I have to step down because it will damage my party and will cause the entire caucus not so to be elected. Hang on. I mean, I feel like, the, like this is, we'll go point counterpoint here, but this is getting a little bit ridiculous. I mean, I'm going to start a grass fire by saying this, but the problem that people may have with Rachel Notley wearing a Che Guevara swatch, what is it? What is the problem? Is it that Che Guevara was a, was a revolutionary that murdered a whole bunch of people and was a terrible human being? Probably, right? Yes. So at the same time, so if so, and here's where the people are going to become appalled, but if we want to start evaluating things based on legacy, you know, wh- what about someone of the, a member of the Catholic faith that's going to come forward? Should they have to answer for all of the ills around the residential schools and the crusades and everything? You see what I'm talking about here? Well, but that's what the point I'm making is that it does seem like if you are on the conservative side of the spectrum, you do have to answer for all of the ills. Whereas when you're on the... the conservatives l- are having to answer for what they're saying on their their social media and, accounts. And the NDP are not having to answer for what they said on their social media accounts, calling people sewer rats, calling embarrassing cousins. Oh, you don't think misspeak. they've had to answer for that? No, I think they get forgiven. I think that there's no consequences to it. I think that, uh, that, be, that you can say anything outrageous on the left. And it, for some reason, it doesn't get the same kind of social media mob going after them. The you way can't it does be when serious. It's a conservative candidate. No, you can't be serious. serious. How many listeners to your show and to mine? have sewer rat emoticons in their Twitter bio. Like, that's been a thing from the moment that Sarah Hoffman said it. It's been a thing from the moment that Rachel Notley referred to Alberta as the embarrassing cousin of Confederation. It's been a thing. It's been, it's been, it's trended on social media for four straight years. Then why, though, is it not something that has so damaged her that she had to step down as, as Minister of Health or that she had to step down and couldn't be a candidate? Why is it that that isn't, you're, you're painting a whole swath of people with a pretty well, negative brush. No, no, no. She was painting, painting sure. a whole swath of people with pretty negative brush and yet here she is deputy uh, campaign manager out there attacking jason kenny as if she's uh, got a record that's uh, clean as the uh, as the pure snow you're talking about sarah hoffman yes yeah yeah. And so that's where I have a problem, is that it seems like uh, you have to have perfection in candidates if they happen to be running under a conservative banner, but you don't have to have perfection. In fact, you can have a lot of warts and, and moles and missteps on the other side of the spectrum, and nobody seems to care. Yeah, well, I mean, the good news is you've got radio shows like this, right, where we, well, I think we're, we're representing pretty diverse populations here. We're going to be reading texts and tweets and taking phone calls in a moment, Daniel. One of the things I, I'd like to point out as well is that politicians are ultimately held accountable at the ballot box. They're held accountable on election day and if Albertans revolt against what they've seen from their NDP they'll do it with a resounding United Conservative or Alberta Party victory or whatever you want to call it, whatever the other alternative is. I will point out specifically and and I think people know this, but people seem to ignore it. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to excuse Sarah Hoffman's sewer rat comment or not, but I'll tell you why I didn't mind it, as a matter of fact, personally. is because she was directly, and I wish she would have clarified, but if you take a look at the timing of the comment and who she was addressing and what was going on at the time, she was referencing rebel media, and she was referencing those that contribute to rebel media's presence in Alberta. And if you take a look at rebel media's record over the last couple of years, including Faith Goldie and everybody else, I would say that the comment probably wasn't that far off. I As know. a matter of fact, if I was Sarah Hoffman, I wouldn't have apologized. Well, but she was being questioned in question period by by Jason Nixon, and it had no context to Rebel Media. He was asking her a serious, straight-up question, and she diverted it with that kind of answer. It was was unfortunate that it wasn't as pointed and focused as it should have been. But should we should we take some calls? Let's do it. <laughs> All right. We got a few that have been waiting for a while here. We got William, Stephen, Jim, Drew, and Charles on my line. I don't know how many you've got on yours, but Lots. let's get them started. <laughs> William, go ahead. Your thought today. Is it me? Yeah, William, go ahead. Oh, man, you guys can talk. <laughs> Oh, my God. Well, you better get to it, other you're going to run out of time. Go ahead, William. What's your point? Well, my point is, what has this got to do with politics? What has it got to do with roads? What has it got to do with hospitals? Hospital staff? 
It has nothing to do with any of those things. Okay, so I'm hearing William wanting to get down and talk about some real issues, and he doesn't think that this matters. Do you have someone on the other side? I do, and let me say to William, like this is the same sort of a thing. That was that was the the uh, the, the mindset that Derek Fildebrand exhibited. You remember this, Danielle? Famously, when about a year ago, he said that I think it was GSAs or whatever he was talking about. He said, quite frankly, social issues weren't in my top 100 priorities. A lot of people want politicians to manage the budget, and that's. It. That's, that's why it. I think that's why conservatives keep getting confused about why it is their personal religious beliefs keep getting dredged up because that's not why they're running. They're running to take care of the fiscal and job and economic issues. I think that's a very fair observation to make. Carol's been holding the line out of Red Deer. Carol, you have the ear of the province. Go ahead. Well, thank you. So I'll just get to one point that you guys were just just discussing about the uh, Danielle's point about the left half not having to be clear as uh, white as snow and the right has to. And you talked about social media. But what, what I notice is the news always picks up on that also. You, you, when, if you watch six, six o'clock news, the national, I got a cold, sorry, or any news channel, you hear about the right not being clear as snow, but you don't hear about the left. So Carol, you news. believe that the news is biased against conservatives? I do. Okay. And did did you watch um, Facebook and the con- congressional when the head of Facebook was in front of the U.S. Congress? Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. Okay. They they even called him on on the right not being represented properly. Okay, Carol, I appreciate the comment. Yeah, Daniel, referencing some of the curated news on Facebook. People are frustrated at being deplatformed, so they're looking for evidence that that's taking place, and unfortunately, when they see that we're not treating both parties in a balanced way, they they read something else into it. That's what I worry about. That's why I think we've got to talk about all these issues. we got Stephen on the line. Stephen, your thought today? Yeah, your uh, Edmonton fellow there says he had no problem with having a crucifix. Uh, I had a problem with that when I was teaching, and uh, the way I got around it after the principal called me in is I had uh, four other religions, five actually, uh, displayed in the classroom, uh, from the menorah to the uh, Hindu gods to uh, the uh, crucifix to the... uh, so he the, did, uh, your, teacher, your teacher didn't want you to wear a crucifix in class? No. Uh, uh, during Christmas, I brought in a crucifix and put it on my computer while I was teaching. Ah, Stephen, and okay. And someone complained about that, so I uh, brought in all the other uh, religions into the class. Good for and you. And I mentioned it to one of the parents, and uh, all the different parents, about 15 of them, uh, were uh, in the principal's office telling him, uh, that uh, he should, uh, he better leave me alone. Stephen, thank you for that. I think that's what people just want: is we can have a religious plurality. That, that's the other, op, uh, the other way you can go with this is that you respect everyone's a religion, as opposed to say, nope, you I mean, have to take all religion from all sides out of politics altogether. I just think that we need to get to a, a, a more moderate and mainstream kind of balance well, on this. Yeah, and you can take religion out of politics without taking religion out of politicians, right? Uh, Daniel, I just want to clarify for I'm, I'm keeping an eye on our text lines here, and a lot of people believe that I don't understand scriptural context, etc. I just want to take 10 seconds of our broadcast to point out I'm a graduate of Calgary's Glenmore Christian Academy. I have a diploma in theology from Cape and Ray Bible School, and I graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree from Trinity Western University in Langley, so I don't need to be lectured by the religious right now. Carl's been holding the line for more than half an hour, Carl. What did you want to put out there? Yeah, hi. I'm, I'm, I'm very upset how this is going. Like, um, I, I do believe that, like, the comments we've heard are very out of like are very wrong. Like I've um I've immigrated from Germany, right? And um I've like exactly those kinds of comments have like moved the party the alternative for Germany like from like being a party focused on an economic issue to an openly racist party and I'm very worried that, that is happening right now in the U C P as well. Okay, Carl, is your vote up for grabs or have you made up your mind who you're voting for? Well I was thinking Conservative. I used to report conservative a lot, but 
this really makes me reconsider. Le, le, okay, Carl, thanks for the le, call. Let me just, your audience wouldn't have heard this this morning, but um, I, I just want him to be rest assured about the ethnic diversity that is within the UCP. Nine out of 20 of the candidates in Edmonton were born outside of Canada. They have a Sudanese candidate, Lebanon, Vietnamese, Philippines, three from India, two from Nigeria. In addition, Leila Hool is running from for Edmonton Islands, Hor Highlands, Norwich. She's a full-blooded Cree. And Nicole Williams from Edmonton, West Hendy is Métis. So in fact, you've got 11 out of 20 Edmonton candidates who are visible minority. So. Yeah, Nicole Williams is the one that found herself at that UCP pub night. You remember that, where the soldiers of Odin showed up? She's had a rough go. I know her personally. She's a great gal. She had a rough go with that. The leader of the Alberta Conservatives, the United Conservative Party, Jason Kenney, spoke to the screening process on, on how candidates are vetted. This is what Mr. Kenney had to say. We, we tried to do vig very vigorous uh, screening and to ensure that uh, people had not expressed uh, truly hateful uh, views, but um, our standard was not perfection. Uh, in, 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 in the world of social media, sometimes people post things that they learn to regret or they've articulated themselves in an in, in, in a, uh, awkward uh, way. Um, but if our standard was that no one had ever said anything that anybody could possibly construe as offensive, that we, you know, that would be a standard that very few people... That was Jason Kenney. And I think that's reasonable, right? And I think that should apply. I guess this is the problem, right, is that if you end up ratcheting it up on the conservative candidates, then the conservative candidates are just going to ratchet up on the NDP candidates, and then we're going to get unreasonableness on both sides. I don't know what the band of reasonable speech actually is, but but I think we've crossed a line somewhere and gone too far. Here's where, here's where I think that, uh, that fair points can be scored against the NDP, and there are a ton of them, Danielle. There's a ton. Two MLAs we know investigated internally for sexual misconduct. Uh, the party's line is that they won't be identified and that the end result of those investigations was that they would be appropriately addressed by a change in behavior, a change of mindset. Uh, for whatever reason, the United Conservatives don't seem to bring that up outside of the grassroots bringing it up. That's not been an official party platform, I think, because they don't want to go play in that sandbox. And then there's the fiscal record as well, where the NDP's vulnerable right now. We'll be back with more here on a province-wide simulcast. This is Decision Alberta with Danielle Smith and Ryan Jesperson. All right. Welcome back. I'm Danielle Smith here with Ryan Jesperson. Yeah, I hope they can hear us all across the province. We do this every week. This week, our topic, race, race, racism, and hate speech. And I've got a few comments coming in. And this, I think, goes directly to the point we're talking about. What about the NDP MLA, Deborah Drever? And why was she excused by not late? Does this not count by the NDP accusers? I think that's the other point, Ryan, is that even when somebody is found guilty of equivalent missteps, oh, all you have to do is uh, go through and put in forward a popular private member's bill and you're cleansed and we'll never talk it ab well, about she, it again. She sat in exile for a year. Right. Yes. Like she was booted from caucus for a year. Well, I, ja well, and then, then you can look at at, at Jason, who's been a, a, a an MP for for oh, I think 20 years or in public life for 20 years, and yet we're still dredging up things that he said when he was or did when he was. Yeah, but you're not comparing Deborah Draver to Jason Kenney, are you? Well, I mean, the one guy wants to be premier, and then he wants to be prime minister of Canada. Deborah Draver, I don't even know if she's running again, is she? Well, uh, I don't know if she's actually running, so you'll have to tell me down here. But I think I think the point is you have to be able to, um, to to move on and have your record stand for itself. And for me, on that issue, we haven't talked about it, but I, I should probably just play that um, the, the uh, ad because I didn't have, I couldn't find it last week when it aired, but I want people to, to hear this ad so they can understand just how hard the NDP is going on this issue. I've helped to lead a, a, a ultimately successful initiative petition which led to a ref referendum which overturned the first gay s spousal law in North America. Jason Kenney bragged about stopping dying AIDS patients from seeing their same-sex spouses in hospital. This man has been campaigning against people's rights his whole life. Is this a premier? Okay, so like that's what I'm talking about. The guy brought a hundred Iranian refugees to Canada to prevent them from being murdered in their home country because uh, homosexuality is against the law. He changed the Citizenship and Immigration uh, 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 Act as well as the the the, um, uh, the guide, so that they, they affirmed gay and lesbian rights. Like, what? How far does a person have to go to protect the lives of gay and, and lesbian Canadians before we recognize that as a public figure and in public life? Life, they're, they're going to take protective actions. So basically, I mean, what we're seeing here is the NDP identify where they think 
the conservatives are most beatable and they're following their playbook, right? And we're seeing the conservatives identify where they think the NDP is most beatable and they're following their playbook. And the conservatives obviously don't think there's a lot of ground to gain by attacking Rachel Notley personally. I think they could probably go after a number of NDP MLAs, but it's tough to do it without being condescending. You know what I mean? Like the, the whole idea of like, you know, these people were like yoga instructors and restaurant servers and bartenders before they were elected. Uh, you got to be careful how, how you roll that message out because you start to identify daycare workers and bartenders and servers and everybody else whose vote you're trying to grab. Obviously, the NDP believes that the conservatives are most beatable. It, the, the polling is formidably in favor of the conservatives. So what does the NDP have to do at Danielle? And we're seeing them follow this playbook right now is they have to portray Jason Kenney as unpalatable as premier. And but that's the, what they're trying to do. But Ryan, don't you don't you find it outrageous that every time there is an extremist attack, a terrorist attack, that conservatives get blamed for creating a polarized environment using polarized language. This, this NDP premier and this NDP campaign is polarizing Albertans. It is peop- it is dividing people. It's not talking about things that unify us. It's negative. And if we end up more polarized after this campaign is over, it will be the NDP's fault, not Jason Kenney's uh, fault. I don't know about that. Okay, let's take some calls and see who agrees. We got, sure. <laughs> we got Jim and Drew and Charles still on the line. Jim, go ahead. Your thought today. I really do hope with the ousting of the NDP that this type of behavior goes as well. You know, it, it, it's, it, 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 when you're talking about crucifixes, in, in legislature, well, do we have to remove the turbans? I mean, I had views on gay marriage at about the same time Jason Kenney made those comments. And I, I've changed my, my, my thoughts. I, I thought to myself, well, why should the man and woman only have the agony of marriage? I mean, well, to give it to the gay people as well. <laughs> so, I mean, if, if people change. And, and, and I think the thing is, is, like, I've got views on whether or not there should be gay-straight alliances in the schools. Now, I'm not against them, but I think there's probably some discussion. So the fact that I want some discussion on it, Edding thinks that I'm, I'm going to out, I'm a homophobe, I'm going to out all the gay people. Like, there's the only, re, the only rebuttal from somebody on the end, uh, Rachel Knott, NDP government is to call you a name. Thanks. That's their only rebuttal. There is it's shut down, no discussion, and that's why this government and legislature is not working. We, why, why can't I have a discussion? Um, you know, it, you can't look. You, you can't tell me that somebody that's a Muslim in in, in legislature doesn't have some deep rooted convictions on female gen, genital mutilation. Jim, let's pa- let's pause you there because I think that's where people are talking. About. Everything is a nuanced discussion, and you you can have a reasonable discussion about where the lines and limits should be without the debate being shut down by being called a bigot. And I think that's how a lot of people are feeling is they can't even talk about where the reasonable lines are. Ryan, do you have something you want to? Yeah, we should. Do one of our most engaged listeners has been holding the line for more than 30 minutes, Danielle. It's Richard and Calling Lake. What do you have on your chest you want to get off, Richard? Well, sir, thank you for taking my call. Well, first, uh, one question is why is the UCP attracting these type of uh, candidates? What are they hearing that attracts them to the party? What is being said that we don't hear? Second question, and uh, no disrespect, but if Miss Danielle Smith is uh, so politically pristine, uh, why was she officially opposing Mr. the late Mr. Prentice in the media while at the very exact time making a backroom deal? To me, that's political fraud. Okay, Richard, I'll put that in front of Danielle. Thanks for the call. You know what? I'm not on campaign here. I'm a media personality, so no, I'm not going to answer that question. Sure. we got Drew on the line. Drew, go ahead. What's your thought today? Hi there. Well, thank you. Uh, I voted both sides, actually three, now that I think about it. Uh, I feel that the... These issues should be brought up by the NDP if they feel they're going to work for them. That being said, there's nothing stopping the UCP from bringing up these issues. But it's not the UCP that's doing it. It's Ms. Smith and others because there's a dumpster fire happening, and every time they go to go on the attack, they have to take and run over and put something else out. Nobody has stopped them as a party if this is what they feel they should be standing on then the ndp should say hey of course i'll even send money because as an election it's this as miss smith has asked why can't we do this or why does it have to be because the majority of people feel a certain way and they're afraid that if we go down this road uh we're going to get our arses kicked well they will 
Okay, so, thanks for that, Drew. So Drew, I think what I hear Drew saying is only secular humanists and atheists and agnostics need apply for public life. And I think that's that's really where it comes down to, is how are we going to allow for religious views to find some space in public office? We are out of time. We are. One the, more. We're going to do this again. At least uh, once a week, Danielle, although I see there are a lot of calls on the text line here from people saying that we should do this more frequently. I don't know about you, but I sure enjoy the robust exchange of ideas, and it's great to have you here on our airwaves. Always a pleasure talking with you, even when we disagree. I sure appreciate your perspective and the fact that we can have a civil conversation. You know Thanks it. for that.